Okay, thank you everybody for being here this evening. I realize this is sort of an intimate gathering and this room doesn't lend itself necessarily terribly well to intimate gatherings, but I'm happy that everyone's here. This is a really important topic for us to talk about tonight and you're gonna get information from a lot of different uh, directions that I think will help everyone at the end of the evening to be a lot more informed about the topic of breast cancer in younger women. So uh, first of all, everybody is at risk for breast cancer. Every woman is at some level of risk and we call that population risk. That's what you get just because of your gender. And you hear a lot of information in the media about the risks for uh, the population. You hear one in nine or even sometimes one in eight being the lifetime risk up to age 85 for a woman who lives in America. Remember that that figure is an overall estimate that includes women who are at really high risk for breast cancer and other women who are probably at much lower risk for breast cancer and it's the combination that produces that overall population risk. Now it's important for people to know what the population's risk for breast cancer is in America because it allows public policy to be drawn and it allows the deployment of different resources towards things like screening and treatment. And studying the pattern and incidence of breast cancer in these large populations also has shed a lot of light on different factors that can make people at risk for breast cancer. So this has been important information and important work. But the statistics that describe the incidence of breast cancer in these large populations really don't tell anything to an individual woman. And that's something that we all know about statistics. Statistics are about big groups, not about individuals. And even if I tell you that your risk of something is 99% versus 1%, I still don't know if you're gonna be in the 99 or in the one. So predicting risk for individuals is much more challenging than trying to develop an overall description of a large population. We understand that there are very well established risk factors for breast cancer and I bet that the majority of the audience today is familiar with most of them. First of all, just being a woman, the risk of a woman, uh, a woman with breast can for, to get breast cancer is much higher than any man it's about 100 women will get breast cancer for every one male. And also breast cancer is a disease where your risk increases as you age. The risk of breast cancer is, generally speaking, very low, below the age of 35 or 40. It starts going up in the decade of the 40s, takes a big blip up around the time of menopause and then continues to rise until it plateaus in the decade of the 70s and remains at that high level for the rest of a woman's life. We also recognize that any woman who has had breast cancer once is at an increased risk to get breast cancer again. Certainly the other breast is at risk and for women who have had breast conserving surgery, the breast that's been treated is at risk over the course of the lifetime and that really merits lifelong surveillance. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Many people are also familiar with the idea that there are reproductive or endocrine uh, factors that increase the risk for breast cancer. Having your first period early, typical age is about 12. Having menopause late, typical age is 50 to 52. Having had no children or having had children after the age of 30. And taking hormones after the typical age of menopause, taking estrogen and progesterone also can be linked to an increased risk for breast cancer. Um, there are some other conditions that occur within the breast that you find out about if you've ever had any surgical biopsy. These are called atypical hyperplasias. They definitely increase the risk for breast cancer. And these are really moderate risk factors. Um, so this is the, they are more potent risk factors than some of the reproductive factors like having a first child after 30. Women who've had radiation treatment to the chest area are at increased risk for breast cancer. The best example in this category is women who were treated for Hodgkin's disease, especially in late adolescence and young adulthood, where the technique of mantle 
radiation given in the T zone like this um, gets scatter of radiation to the breast that increases the risk for breast cancer. We're also going to talk a little bit about some of the lifestyle factors, obesity, smoking, alcohol, and how they impact on breast cancer risk. We're going to talk about breast density on mammography a little bit. And we're going to spend some time, you thought I left it out, I didn't. We're going to spend some time talking about family history too, because we all recognize that's an important risk factor for breast cancer. Now this, this uh, table, it's a little busy. It looks at the, uh, this is from the American Cancer Society statistics from 2011, looking at the probability for a woman to develop breast cancer by decade age intervals. And if you look, let me see if this works. If you look at the, no, it doesn't. If you look at the first column, which is of interest to this audience, particularly birth to age 39, and look at the underlined uh, row, which is for breast, female breast cancer, you can see that the risk for breast cancer from birth to age 39 is about 1 in 207. And then it goes up, 1 in 27 in the next decade, 1 in 29, and then 1 in 15 and 1 in 8. So the risk for breast cancer has a big age relationship based on these statistics, um, and this is for the big population. Risk factors, we can make a list of them, but they don't have the same weight. They are of different magnitude and importance. So some of the uh, moderate risk factors include some of the reproductive things that we spoke about, hormone therapy, lifestyle factors. And then the next level of risk is some of those conditions in the breast, the atypical hyperplasias. They create a little bit more risk. They bring a little bit more risk. And then the highest risk category for breast cancer is women who have the inherited genetic predisposition to develop the disease. And here we're talking about some of the well-known genetic abnormalities, for instance, in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Now, again, in order to try to develop a risk prediction for an individual woman, it's kind of a challenge because people are messy and they may have risk factors that come from a lot of different directions at once and the individual woman may be a combination of things. She has a particular age at the time of the assessment, maybe there's family history, maybe there are reproductive factors, and the totality of the risk for the individual is some combination of all of these individual factors. Plus, when we talk about assessing a woman's risk for breast cancer, we recognize that that risk is not a static quality, and it will change over time. It's going to go up over time as she ages. So it's got to be redone at intervals. To make the situation even more complicated, when someone has more than one risk factor, they combine, and the risk is not necessarily just an addition of the risk factors. Sometimes there's a synergistic effect. So what this slide shows you is that women who have family history of breast cancer and also have atypia in the breast, one of those conditions that you'd find on a surgical biopsy, there the risks sort of magnify and they synergize. So atypia alone, about a five times increase in risk, but if you combine it with family history, then you're looking at an increase in risk that's somewhere between 10 and 20 times baseline risk. So these risk factors also need to be looked at in combination. It's a condition that you find in the breast on a biopsy. It has to do with the way the cells of the ducts or the lobules look under the microscope. You'd only know it if you had tissue sampled and looked at under the microscope. No, it's not cancer, it's atypia, which is a risk marker. Um, so given the fact that it's so difficult, why should we even think about trying to give women some kind of information about their potential risk for breast cancer? So what's the benefit of even doing the exercise? Well, some kind of an objective assessment helps people understand their level of risk better. Saying high, medium, low, increased doesn't help as much as giving some objective information. And then by helping people understand their level of risks, they and their healthcare providers can start talking about what strategy they're going to utilize to manage that risk. And it's really important for us on the medical side to be able to put people in accurate risk categories so we can figure out 
whether or not our interventions are actually working for women at a given level of risk. Now, in order to try to help us make an objective or quantified risk assessment, um, there are a few different approaches that we take. So certainly, women who are in families where it looks like the tendency to breast cancer is inherited as a genetic quality, in families like that, genetic testing can be tremendously helpful in clarifying risk. What those families look like, we've all seen them. Generation after generation of women affected with breast cancer, usually at young ages, more often the cancer happens in both breasts than you see in the general population, and you can see a mix in of other cancers, especially ovarian cancer. Women in those kinds of families, if testing, genetic testing shows uh, one of the mutations in these genes, then it tells us a lot about their potential risk for breast cancer. Women who have these mutations have a lifetime risk for breast cancer that's somewhere between 50 and 85 percent. It's just enormous. And their risk for ovarian cancer is substantially higher than the general population at 16 to 40 percent. So for women who are in this group, and this is not a huge group of women, the genetic testing can provide tremendous clarity about their risk for both breast and ovarian cancer. Now, there's also over the years been interest in trying to develop mathematical models that try to give women an estimate of their breast cancer risk by combining all of those various risk factors that we talked about and giving them the appropriate weight. And this slide shows you a few of the different models that are available and the kind of risk factors that they incorporate into the calculation. The most commonly used one is called the Gale model. Um, some people may have heard about it. It's really very widely uh, applicable and available. It includes all the factors that you see on the slide. The woman's age, her age at uh, first period, the age that she was when she had her first child, the number of close relatives with breast cancer. First degree means parents, siblings, and children. And also it includes information about whether or not she ever had a surgical biopsy of the breast and whether or not it showed that high risk condition called atypia. And the Gale model then produces an estimate for the woman that she will get breast cancer within the next five years and a lifetime estimate of risk. So some actual statistics and numbers to provide. Now, these models are really just crude and fairly primitive um, estimates of risk. And there are lots of situations in which even this scale model doesn't give a woman a lot of accuracy in her risk. It underestimates the risk when the family history goes beyond the close relatives. It isn't validated for non-Caucasian populations. And there is a question of how well this predicts risk for women below the age of 35. So although this is a widely available model, not so helpful to very, very young women who are at risk for breast cancer. Also, there are lots of women for whom the models really don't seem to apply to them so well. Some of the assessments are very hard in women, let's say, who are adopted, who don't know anything about their family history. Looking at family history is hard if there are very few women within the family. And also, uh, the interactions between some of these risk factors are kind of hard to pin down so that they can be used in the mathematical models. So these models are a beginning of this effort to estimate risk, but they're really limited and they need refinement before we're going to be able to give women accurate information based on just this calculation. Now, some other risk factors have now become much more acknowledged, and one of them is mammographic density. So as you can see on the slide, this is a quality that is measured on a mammogram. It's not about how your breasts feel to you or to your doctor. It's about the way they look on a mammogram. And mammographic density is the proportion of the glandular tissue in the breast that's seen on the mammogram compared to the amount of fatty tissue in the breast, which is also a normal component of breast tissue. So this is an example. 
The mammogram picture on your left shows a breast that's not very dense at all. And you can see there's a lot of contrast. The fatty areas look black and dark gray. And the glandular areas are the white strands that you can see throughout the tissue. And that's the kind of a breast where the mammogram is actually a pretty sensitive test. On the other side, you see mammogram pictures that show you very, very dense tissue where there's an awful lot of the white and very little of the black and gray. And the radiologists don't have a lot of contrast to look at. And it can be really difficult to identify a developing mass within that kind of dense tissue. So one issue is that this density makes the mammograms harder to read. But it also seems to be that women who have a lot of breast density are at an increased risk to develop breast cancer independent of all their other risk factors. And this is some work that was published in 2006 that shows that as a woman's breast density goes up, her relative risk of breast cancer also goes up. This is intriguing information. It's really important for women to have a sense of their breast density, especially younger women whose breasts already tend to be denser than older women. And the density by itself may also be uh, something that, that contributes to a higher risk. Now, normally, breast density goes down with age. And this slide is some data that we got here at NYU by looking at women who were having screening mammograms in our facility. And it shows you that especially as women age past the time of menopause and their estrogen levels go down, that affects the breast in a way that the density tends to go down. But I'm going to draw your attention to some of the left-hand side, I guess it's your right-hand side, of this graph which shows you women in the 60s and 70s and even greater than 80 where there's still a meaningful proportion of women whose breasts are really dense. So we have to kind of think about that a little bit. The density of the breast is a part of your mammogram report. And there's actually legislation in a number of states right now that requires women to be informed about their breast density. And that gives them a little bit of a handle on whether or not they're at increased risk. And I think even more importantly, some information about how accurate mammography by itself may or may not be uh, for their early detection methodologies. And this is just another representation of the same data. It's condensed a little bit. I think it's a little bit easier to show, where you can see that women in their 70s, about 30% of them still have dense breasts. So something that you should know about, and it's part of your mammogram report. And this is something that, as years go on, we're going to learn a little bit more about why women have dense breasts and how it contributes to increasing their risk for breast cancer. Now, for lots of younger women who are at increased risk for breast cancer, the way that they know they're at increased risk is about their family history. That's the biggest issue in younger women. And in that situation, genetic testing, as we spoke about, can give tremendous clarity if they, sh they find out that they're in one of those families where it's the genetic mutation. But I also have to tell you that genetic testing by itself doesn't tell the whole story. And we are familiar, all of us, and Dr. Oratz and I, you're going to hear from her in a few minutes, have been involved in lots of research projects on this, in this area. There are lots of families where there's breast cancer in every generation down the line, young women affected and so on, and the genetic testing doesn't show a mutation in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. So what that really means is that the science just hasn't caught up to that, those families yet, and we really have to do a lot of hard work to understand why some families have this pattern of breast cancer that doesn't seem to be attached to the BRCA genes. Um, the atypical hyperplasias that we spoke about, it's unusual for younger women to know about that information because most they've very unfrequently that they've had surgical biopsies um, so that they are less likely to know about these conditions um, however, when they are found, they seem to have the same implications to younger women. But in terms of the risk as one ages, it also seems like women who are diagnosed with these high-risk conditions when they're young, if they're able to go 10 years without developing breast cancer, at that point the risk seems to go down again. So these are also uh, time-dependent and change over time, and may, the risk may go down uh, over the years. 
So we've talked a lot about what makes somebody high risk. Now let's talk a little bit about what we can offer women who are at increased risk for breast cancer. Um, and there are three real categories here, intensive surveillance, prevention with medication, and risk-reducing surgery. So let me just introduce the topic by saying that you can see that breast self-exam, I didn't mention it, and there's been a lot of talk lately about how breast self-exam doesn't save women's lives from breast cancer, and you know, that's true. But that doesn't mean that you should ignore an obvious problem in the breast, and uh, we should certainly continue to counsel women to be aware of what's going on in their breasts and bring abnormalities to the appropriate medical attention. When we talk about surveillance of high-risk women, we have to also recognize that mammography right now is the only breast imaging modality that we can show can reduce the death rate or mortality from breast cancer when it's done regularly. When should someone start doing mammography? Well, that depends. The general guidelines say by age 40, but for younger women who are at high risk, especially with a family history of breast cancer in younger women, we may want to move that age down. And uh, the, some of the broad guidelines include screening a woman five to 10 years before the age of diagnosis of a close relative. But there's an issue with that too, because the sensitivity of mammography, as we said, in these young women with dense breasts is not as high as we'd like it to be. And that's a situation where we look for additional information from other tests that complement the mammography. One of them is ultrasound. And this is a, a big study that was done by the American College of Radiology that showed that if you add ultrasound to mammography, you can pick up some additional breast cancers that were not seen on the mammogram, but were picked up on the ultrasound. The additional pickup rate is modest, but ultrasound is an easy technique. There's no radiation involved. There's no compression involved. Doesn't hurt. And it seems to be something that's very uh, acceptable, especially the younger women who need to be screened for breast cancer. MRI is something we talk about a lot. And certainly, it has the most sensitivity to diagnose breast cancer of any test that we have available to us right now. Um, this study, which I like to show when I talk about MRI, was specifically looking at women who had cancer in one breast. And they did an MRI and also looked at the other breast. And it turned out that they picked up about 3% of new cancers in the other breast when the mammogram and the sonogram were both negative. So that's the additional pickup rate of MRI. And MRI is capable of uh, when high-risk women are screened, and this study had to do with women with genetic mutations, MRI is certainly capable of diagnosing breast cancers that were not seen on mammography or ultrasound and helping those women increase their odds for early detection of cancer when it occurred. Why don't we do it for everybody? Well, there are a bunch of disadvantages here. MRI is really expensive. It's not fun. And anyone who's had a breast MRI will definitely attest to that. Um, also, especially in younger women, it's hormone dependent, and the results depend to a certain degree on the point in the cycle when they're done. Um, and some people just can't do it. They're claustrophobic, or they have MRI incompatible devices like aneurysm clips or pacemakers that really don't allow them to do the test. So right now, breast MRI is used for really high risk women like BRCA carriers and women whose lifetime risk for breast cancer is. 25% or more. Um, it can be used in other scenarios, like evaluating newly diagnosed women and so on. But for screening purposes, it's reserved for the highest risk women where the benefits seem to outweigh the downsides. Surveillance is about early detection of disease should it occur. Medications can be used not just um, to, uh, as part of the treatment for breast cancer, but even certain medications can lower the risk for breast cancer in high-risk women. And the medication that was the first one that was shown to do this is called tamoxifen, which is a, a medication that is part of the treatment for young women who have hormone-sensitive uh, breast cancers. We know that when it's given to high-risk women for five years, they, uh, the risk of breast cancer can be cut about in half. It only prevents those hormone-sensitive cancers, which makes sense understanding the way that the drug works. Um, tamoxifen is a drug where the side effects are widely understood. 
that can cause hot flashes and menopausal symptoms. Tamoxifen also increases the risk of blood clots and small increase in the risk of uterine cancer, particularly seen in women over 50. And this makes tamoxifen a drug that, although it's widely available for prevention, is something that a lot of women find unappealing. Now, I also would draw your attention to the fact that the information about tamoxifen as a preventative did not include, that trial didn't include women under 35. So it's really unclear how well it works for very young women. Plus, during the five years of the tamoxifen treatment, women are asked not to uh, get pregnant. They can't get pregnant or have children. So for women who are still considering childbearing, it's very unappealing to commit themselves to taking the drug for five years. So this is a strategy that a lot of younger women don't take. There are other drugs that are available for prevention, but unfortunately, at this point, those other drugs, raloxifene or Evista and Exemestane or Aromacin is the brand name, are not available for premenopausal women. They are only used in postmenopausal women. So prevention for younger women is really all about tamoxifen if you're going to do it with a medicine. There's also surgery. And certainly for the women at the highest risk for breast cancer, this is an option that people undertake. We recognize the fact, and this is, I'm showing you some data from a very old study. It's old now, 1999, but looked at uh, a very big population of women with prophylactic mastectomies and showed that for high-risk women who had prophylactic mastectomies, the reduction in breast cancer risk was 90 to 95%. Um, and that's a really good number. So this is the intervention that can reduce the risk as much as is possible to do at this point in time. But that's really a big price for women to pay, to have their breasts removed, even if they're reconstructed. Now, this slide specifically looks at a population of women who did prophylactic mastectomies, and they were BRCA carriers. So they're the highest risk women, and they did this intervention. And you can see that the women who did the mastectomies, that's the straightish line at the top, really had a huge benefit in preventing uh, breast cancer, as versus the women in the other line that you can see goes down pretty rapidly um, in terms of their development of breast cancer. So this intervention is certainly effective in higher risk women. They saw, again, about a 95% uh, reduction in the risk of uh, breast cancer. And this is also specifically seen in women who also were preventing ovarian cancer by removing their ovaries. Again, these are mutation carriers at risk for both disease, diseases. So there is, again, a synergistic effect between these two operations. Now, I'm not going to talk about this a lot, but we said that women with the genetic mutations for breast cancer are also at increased risk for ovarian cancer. And because of un the unfortunate fact that there are no effective early detection methods for ovarian cancer, these women are generally recommended to have their ovaries removed at a relatively young age. By removing the ovaries at a young age and inducing early menopause, these women also, by the way, lower their risk of breast cancer just with that intervention. And you can see from this slide that the younger a woman is when she induces menopause in that manner, the more she reduces her risk for breast cancer. So even for women who are at increased risk for breast cancer because of the genetic mutations, you can also get the sense that there are a lot of different ways for them to address those risks and to try to protect themselves as much as possible. Um, there are some new strategies about prevention that are coming out. And here I'm really talking a little bit about lifestyle issues. Smoking is a very well accepted risk factor for breast cancer. I think that that's indisputable right now. And um, alcohol use at the level of seven drinks per week has been shown to increase the risk of breast cancer by approximately 20%. So these are modifiable risk factors. These are things that people can control about their own lifestyles, not about drugs, not about surgery, that can help them reduce their risk for breast cancer. We also know that obesity increases the risk for breast cancer in postmenopausal women. And some people think that's because the fatty tissue makes a little bit of estrogen. But some more recent work suggests that people who are obese have an increase 
in the levels in their blood of some components that are associated with inflammation, and that may actually be the mechanism by which they increase their risk for breast cancer, both when they're younger and when they're older. So once again, these are modifiable risk factors for breast cancer, and this is a great opportunity for women who are both at increased risk and even baseline risk to try to lower their risk without using medical interventions. Now, uh, you know, I, I put this slide in here just to mention the fact that we have to acknowledge that screening mammography has come under a lot of fire in the last few years in terms of some controversies about how effective is it and are we doing it too much and are we harming people? And today we're not going to talk about that controversy very much. Um, you can see that a lot of very smart and important people in America have weighed in on it. Dr. Susan Love, our favorite, down at the bottom. Dan Copans in the middle, the father of modern mammography in America. And uh, Otis Brawley from the American Cancer Society all came out and talked about what they thought about screening mammography. But I'm going to show you this. This is a paper that was published kind of around the time that this controversy was hitting and suggesting the fact that the decline that we've seen in America in breast cancer mortality has really resulted from early detection based on screening and that this is an, still a very important element of the struggle against breast cancer in America is still about screening and about screening mammography. Now, shifting gears a little bit, women who've already been treated for breast cancer, especially when they're young, we know they're at increased risk for the rest of their life to develop cancer in their opposite breast or maybe to get a recurrence in the breast that was treated with a breast-conserving surgical approach. And we have surveillance protocols. We have ideas. We have standardized methods and strategies to screen those women going forward. And those strategies are based on the individual woman's age, the density of her breast, and sometimes on the characteristics of the disease that was the first episode. And an example here is that a woman whose breast cancer initially did not show up on mammography when she was initially diagnosed, that's not uncommon in younger women, for that woman we want to make sure that the surveillance moving forward also includes other types of testing like ultrasound and MRI. So these protocols are out there, they should be individualized, and I strongly encourage women to consult with their breast surgeons and their oncologists about how they should be screened after a breast cancer diagnosis. So in conclusion, individualized breast cancer risk assessment is really critical to let us maximize the benefit from all our screening tests and help us evaluate new interventions to see how effective they are in women at different levels of risk. Mammography is still a really important tool for early detection of breast cancer, and women in all risk categories should be screened regularly. Don't forget the lifestyle issues. They're really important. It's a great opportunity for women to try to reduce their own risk, and women who are at increased risk should think about all the different opportunities and options they have to try to modify uh, their risk, and their choices and strategies may change over time. Breast cancer survivors need continued surveillance to monitor for the possibility of recurrence in a treated breast and the development of breast cancer in the opposite breast, and this approach should be individualized for each woman depending on the unique characteristics of her and her cancer. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Axelrod, and we look forward to questions and answers at the end.